Hey, so the title of our presentation today is Big Team, Big Project, No Time. So uh, this is a sort of fun title that we've stolen from an internal presentation uh, that we had in the office recently. And it speaks to really uh, working on uh, big projects, uh, big projects uh, with a really tight uh, or unrealistic schedule at times. Uh, to respond to that, you need a big team. And to manage the big team through the BIM process, uh, you need uh, Naveen, our BIM manager, and uh, you need some really innovative processes to make that happen. So, uh, uh, Brandon made the introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew McDonough, I'm the principal at the firm, and uh, Naveen Nabil is our uh, BIM manager. Um, so, we're Montgomery Sizem Architects. Uh, the types of projects, um, uh, we take on a variety of projects uh, from educational, institutional, mental health, long-term care. Uh, we're always looking for uh, a community or social value in the types of projects that we take on. Uh, so the agenda for today, um, so I'm going to give you, uh, so item one there, I'm going to give you an overview of the modular projects. I'm going to talk about um, a specific set of projects, uh, which is our Toronto modular portfolio. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the design and hone in on the on an individual module, uh, and then I'll take you through the shop construction and site construction of that. Um, our design build partner for these projects is NRV. Um, so uh, Naveen then is going to talk about the uh, BIM overview, the challenges that we face uh, in realizing those projects, uh, some of our model setup documentation, and then I'll, uh, I'll take it back over to talk about the final product and some Q&A. So uh, this is the uh, seven projects uh, that are currently um, uh, in our Toronto uh, modular portfolio. The two in red, 11 Macy Avenue and 321 Dover Court Road, those are constructed and occupied as of the start of 2021. Um, the remaining five projects are in various stages of their development with one active on site at the moment. I'm gonna to focus today's uh, sort of the portion of my talk uh, on the uh, 11 Macy Avenue and Dover Court Road as they're constructed. I have a, a sequence of those from start to finish. Um, okay, so on screen now you're seeing uh, all of our um, Toronto modular projects. The top left hand side is the two uh, phase one projects uh, and the remaining five are the projects that are actively in design or uh, in the case of one of them under construction. Uh, you can see some similarities in the, the design language between each of these projects. And uh, at the same time, each individual project responds to the unique site conditions and uh, community engagement process and uh, uh, basically developing their design with, uh, with various stakeholders from the city of Toronto, the housing secretariat and, uh, uh, and urban planning, urban design. Uh, so what is the module itself? So I've taken one of our uh, typical site plans, uh, or one of our site plans for one of our projects, this is Don Avenue. Um, the lines that just appeared on screen, now that is the delineation of each of the modules. Um, and so then the individual module, it's comprised of two suites and a corridor uh, for the majority of cases, or in the instance of the stairs that you're seeing on the floor plan on the screen, uh, it's the stairs plus the corridor uh, plus a mechanical or electrical room or janitor's closet or other, other ancillary space. Uh, so what's important here is, is the first off the shape of the module, the overall dimension is uh, just shy of 20 meters by 3.7 meters, uh, 3.7 meters grid to grid. Uh, the outside walls of the module um, form half of the fire separation between uh, one suite and the next or between one module and the next. Um, what you're seeing on the bottom of the screen there, the 3D, is essentially the module that uh, comes out of the shop. Uh, so the shop process itself, uh, I'll run through this fairly quickly. Uh, this uh, top left corner, you've just seen a, a view of the inside of uh, NRB, our design build partner, their shop. Um, second image then uh, to the right of that is the flat pack, a modular process unto itself. The rough uh, framing arrives into the shop, uh, gets uh, um, unstacked and uh, drywall is installed, uh, various uh, devices, whatever the case may be that's required at that time, cutouts are put together. Uh, the modules themselves get uh, 
um, three D. I think is the word that they use in the shop, uh, but they get um, uh, assembled into what you're seeing in the bottom left hand side, which is the rough framing complete uh, for a number of modules. Um, the last two images on this slide is uh, really to, to show one of the major benefits of modular, which is um, to do with a safe working environment and uh, an environment that promotes a deficiency free construction. You're able to lift the module up to the, uh, uh, the a safe working height, install plumbing, electrical, whatever the case may be, to the underside. And uh, we're able to inspect that uh, closely uh, for you know, removal of any deficiencies. But what, you're what we're finding in general is there's very few. Um, next, some shots of the interior construction of the module. So you've just seen uh, some plumbing rough-ins uh, in the top three images, including some electrical rough-ins on the kitchen on the right-hand side. Some views of the uh, inside face of the exterior wall with the window installed. Uh, some more close-up views. This is really, again, to talk about that deficiency review process. The nature of modular is to say that uh, there's always a, a one module ahead of the next one behind. And so if you're catching deficiencies early in the construction process, uh, they're being fed into all of the modules coming up behind. So it's a very seamless process. Uh, bottom left, then, uh, is a near-finished barrier-free suite. And then uh, bottom center is a suite waiting final clean. And then lastly, just a, I've included a finished image of the suite uh, that's installed on site, uh, ready for occupancy. Um, okay, up at the top here, back in the shop, uh, there's some waterproofing uh, that's required because, and it's, I, I'll call this some, to a certain extent redundant waterproofing because the modules do sit in an outdoor environment uh, for a short period of time before they're installed uh, at the site. Uh, so in the center image, you're seeing that waterproofing plus a, an EBDM roof. And then at the top, uh, you're seeing that module being hauled out of the shop and laid down uh, in the yard waiting to be shipped to the site. Uh, so the sites themselves, again, I'm dealing with the phase one sites, which is uh, 11 Macy Avenue and 321 Dovercourt Road. You're just seeing what's a more traditional construction process happening there, which is to say the excavation foundations, but below grade site surfacing, and then uh, the uh, ultimate readiness. Uh, what you're seeing in the bottom left is the readiness for trucking and craning. Okay, then the trucking and craning process. Um, so the modules get, uh, I suppose there's two methods uh, for stacking and installing the modules uh, that were employed at both of the different sites, just dependent on the schedule. But what's really incredible about this process is the installation of the modules at both 11 Macy Avenue and, uh, and 321 Dovercourt Road took a total of five days. Uh, after that, uh, what you're seeing in the stream of uh, photos in the middle is the interconnection of the shear plates, which uh, combine to make the individual modules one structural, structurally sound building. Um, and then uh, over on the right-hand side, uh, the next phase is installation of some site cladding, which uh, is, is, is different for each building, just depending on the, the site-specific requirements or the, uh, um, uh, you know, depending on, I suppose community engagement process and comments as well. Uh, the bottom then uh, is uh, waterproofing of the shear plates that were installed for, uh, on site, and then ultimately cladding on the uh, on the bottom right hand side near complete with the building nearly ready for occupancy. Okay, so I have gone through my process as quick as I could to uh, be an appetizer for the main event. Uh, Naveen is going to take you through our BIM process, which gets us to. Um, uh, which just demonstrates our, our process to get us through the, uh, the, the um, uh, to get us to ultimate execution. So I'll hand you over to Naveen now. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Enda, for the overview of the project and the pro progress on site. Today, I'll be discussing our BIM process, mainly the model setup, and discuss some of the challenges that we faced when deploying modular projects in Revit. Um, our first challenge, as you might have already guessed, that we have multiple sites using the same modules. These modules were constantly evolving in the design and they need to stay current in all projects. We have a large team that we needed to stay coordinated in order to deploy the modules and apply design changes as well throughout the, all projects. We have also unique site conditions and site-specific cladding 
that needed to also be addressed. Therefore, we wanted to uh, be efficient in terms of our model setup and be able to produce to be able to produce this project. When we're thinking about modular projects in terms of Revit setup, uh, it brings up an old age debate. Um, do we use groups or do we use links? There are pros and cons to each of these um, uses. It all depends on what better fits the challenges addressed in the previous slides. So the following slides will discuss this in the context of this project. First item here, we have the groups. Um, let's say if the modular portion of the project was uh, created ut utilizing the groups, that means all elements of that groups need to be placed in the same work set. This means user one and user two cannot be entering the modules and making design changes at the same time. Um, you'll run into this permission battle, which is what I took a screenshot of here, is that one user have to uh, relinquish ownership in order for another user to come in and make changes. Um, okay. Further, uh, we later realized that we ran into uh, nesting groups because we wanted to deploy all the um, modules across the, the, the project vertically, and we wanted them to all update at the same time. Once you have uh, nested groups, you'll run into first permission issues at the same time. Uh, you may get stuck in permission loops uh, and also causes some errors in the element attachment and the group origin as well. We call this like a groupception. Okay, so uh, groups, uh, as I mentioned, they can be useful um, in, in order to... Um, transfer the information from one level to another if they are repeated. Um, so you can update one level and then all the other levels update at the same time. Um, you can also utilize groups to um, export one floor plate with all the layouts to other mod models as well in order to start a new project. Uh, something to keep in mind, if you're using groups in a project, this will hinder the performance of your uh, model and it will cause mo model corruption. Um, also, uh, groups struggle with mirroring some of the groups uh, and causes um, elements not aligning properly or not mirroring properly. Um, later as well, um, ele elements will get constraints outside the group, will also cause, cause model corruption. Um, and something that is very crucial to keep in mind if you're using groups for the modules and you have mul multiple sites, that one of the modules in one project will be up to date while the others will not catch up. So you'll have to maybe repeat the project, repeat the work twice in order to have both of your projects updated at the same time because groups are native to one project. Um, so we run into this issue constantly with using groups. You know, you get this warning where it says, oh, I'm going to fix your groups. Uh, the best thing <laughs> you can do here. So users were like, OK, fix groups. Um, so what this creates, it creates another group uh, with with like, let's say a number like number one or two, and it would lose association to the instance of that group um, of the original group. So then you end up uh, with two groups next to each other, but they will not talk to each other. They will not get updated at the same time. With this kind of behaviors with groups, we could not afford this um, setback with this tight deadline. Also, uh, groups, if you think about them, they are kind of like porous. The elements inside them, they will start sticking to uh, nearby elements that are near them. So let's say we have this condition at grid, uh, what Endo is alluding to is the fire separation, which is half a wall in one module, another half a wall in the other module. They need to be connected uh, with the shell to create this L, the clean cut when you're, you're drawing. So uh, we run into this issue because of the close proximity is that they, are st they start sticking to each other. So because the design uh, was uh, evolving and changing a lot is that this issue kept kept occurring. Um, so we came up with this hybrid solution by utilizing both groups and links uh, in the project uh, to uh, enable, to first of all, uh, enable 
several users to be working um, in the links simultaneously at the same time. So let's say if I'm editing uh, the green unit and I, I, I can edit it with someone else at the same time. And then in the main model, we utilize a massive group that defines that kind of repeatable floors that goes all the way up so that they would update at the same time. Uh, you would only um, enter this uh, bigger group if you're making relationship changes between the units. Otherwise, no one would be entering that group and it would still remain communicating with the other groups they update at the same time. Okay, so this gave us, um, let's say this is a stat that I um, pulled up from a project. It had 20 unique modules as linked um, models and we had 70 linked instances of that same model. Um, so this kind of gave us a resilient system um, and improved model performance drastically. There were no big crashes. Uh, users were able to produce their work and work simultaneously. Uh, but then we um, ran into this kind of issue where your computer is utilizing a lot of its resources like memory and it would say, it's, um, you know, I'm going to crash, <laughs> help me. Uh, so high usage uh, is something that you're going to notice because of that. So then we came up with uh, with work sets. And uh, these work sets uh, are called zones work sets. So basically what work set is, um, so work set is kind of a critical uh, item in, in this workflow to make it work. Uh, work set, they're simply a portion of the file that can be opened and closed and managed independently to utilize less of your computer resources when you're working in the model. Um, so that's what we kind of call the zones work set. So level one, two, and three, and four, uh, let's say uh, all, all um, Revit links that are on level one are on zone one, all of them on level two are on zone two, uh, three, and four accordingly. So um, if you are a user that is working only on level one that day, you can close level three, four, and five, and you don't have to utilize your computer memory to, to make any of the um, annotation, let's say, uh, in the main model. So this kind of allowed us to create some sort of a hierarchy in the model. Uh, this is kind of a 3D view version of it. These are the names of the work sets on the side there. Um, and so let's say if you are not working on the site elements or any of the uh, shell, then you can close them uh, or any other levels that you're not working on. Um, so uh, each of these uh, links that are the modules, they inherently have their own work sets. So let's say, um, so let's say you have um, work sets uh, like the furniture, right? So these furniture will be uh, turned on and off simultaneously at the same time throughout the entire model. So let's say you have uh, one module on the left side and a different one in the middle, right? But they both have furniture and you want to turn them off entirely in the project. Although you don't have any elements in the main model that are in that work set, you just have the name. You can turn it off uh, in the main model, addressing all the models at the same time going to go back to this one slide. So here, if I'm, if I'm talking about the, um, the deployment of these links across the project, there is one thing to note that is really important is that the, uh, there are, there is a type work set and there is an instance work set. So when you link a model, it has these two properties. We had to create a type work set that is always going to be on, right? Um, and for the duration of the project. And then the only thing that you're gonna control in order to utilize less or more of your computer power is your instance work sets. Uh, and these were the ones that were referring to the zones. Okay, so what should be uh, included in those links? Uh, so one thing to know, uh, we had created a nested link as well uh, in here that is the structure. And that included the uh, structural floors and the roof. Um, and that was the same one that is deployed across all the modules. The remaining elements were in the module main model. Uh, something to note in here is that we flattened some of our furniture 
to help with uh, the performance issues along the way. Uh, and uh, also one other important thing to know is that we've included the doors in these linked modules. Um, uh, since we did that, uh, there was like a whole debate on, you know, we're going to be stripping away the ability for these modules to contain instance parameters because it's the same module that is repeated everywhere in the project. You can't have like door one, two, three, four. You'd have to address them by type. If you're looking to utilize instance parameter, then that's something that you discuss early on. That's something that may need to move to the main model. But for this project, they stick to the type instance uh, a type approach for these doors, and that's how we we've, we've um, done our documentation. So the overall model setup. Uh, this is kind of an overview um, from a screenshot from the Miro board. Uh, I utilize Miro board to kind of give the team an overview on how the models are being set up. Um, and this is kind of like a mind map that it would, it would explain that. So we have the main model. Uh, so there, each, each site had a main model, each site had a site model, each site had a shell model, and we also had a visualization model which had like extra Enscape materials um, that we may not need. Oops, sorry. So in here, um, from this uh, workflow, it kind of explains to you what goes into each model, and this kind of uh, helps the team as well when they come into the project or they're working on the project, they understand where these elements go. So they, they know exactly where to go and where to edit something. So um, each of these projects had a site that's geolocated. Everything else acquired the coordinates from that site and we linked everything via shared coordinates. If you uh, look at the modules, however, they are linked and they are manually aligned to align with the grid locations. Um, these are these links are also attached to the main model. So let's say there is a third layer linking like a consultant model or we're looking at it from the shell model or the site model. Uh, we are able to see these modules because they are set to attach. They're not overlay. Okay, so this is kind of like an overview of the model setup. Um, having the shell there as well helped us have a different um, uh, colors or materials uh, for the different sites, which is what Enda alluded to, which is the the uh, the cladding after the the, the backup wall, um, and that was kind of specifically done for each site. We created one that was kind of the template, and then we carried it on throughout the other projects. Uh, this is uh, another over um, screenshot of the Miro board. We had like a to-do list that I've created like a Kanban diagram uh, that would um, help me understand where the team is in terms of certain tasks. And I had like a BIM representative on each project that's able to update me or we can talk about the issues that the team came up with and we can evolve our process accordingly. Um, if you look at the overall uh, module setup here, um, you will find that uh, each of these sites, these are two sites, and they are sharing the same modules. Okay, this is um, another like approach that we are kind of pondering and thinking about is that we are creating the the structure in a in a in a file and then the units uh, instead of including as you saw earlier the two units. Uh, in the one module, we've separated them. So because some of the modules, we saw some repeated work. So some of the modules will have uh, a unit and then something else can be in front of it. Like uh, mainly happens in the main floor where uh, amenities and stuff like that are happening there. Uh, one of the major caveat of using the links uh, is the orphan tags. This is something that teams would uh, need to be aware of. So what happens if you have, um, so basically you have two separate users working in the same model. One user uh, has the background updated with all, let's say the modules up to date as other teams are working on the layout and designing um, and they are annotating in the main model. Uh, a second person comes in that had their model, maybe uh, the background is not, the link is not updated or it's out of date then what happens is that um, they will get the tags from the main model, they will get orphaned. Uh, so these tags will, will say, okay, what am I tagging here? I can't see the element, therefore I'm just gonna get orphaned. Uh, so then uh, this uh, ran into the issue where the team, we had to come up with a workflow to, to kind of um, 
get over this kind of error that we got is that we we created one day for modeling and one day for annotating or half a day for modeling and half a day for annotating. So everyone has the same background. That's one workflow. The other one is that they would uh, have to uh, reload the, the linked elements affected before syncing so that the, the tags will catch up. Although this was a huge setback uh, for us, uh, um, we have good news for that is that Revit 2022 improved the behavior of the tags in the host models referencing element in a link model. What happens is that when you reload your link, what it does, it remembers the element ID and it automatically reattaches to that element. You will not be doing reconciling hosting. Uh, that won't be uh, necessary anymore. Uh, I know you're all thinking about this. Uh, so what happens when you have uh, module design changes? What we ended up utilizing is design options within these modules. We made the primary one uh, is the one that is deployed everywhere. And then the other ones were the ones that were um, kind of unique conditions that this happened in. This is a screenshot of where the team kept track of what design option needed for which site. So you'll see here at the top, the, the various sites and the various modules and several information, the team was uh, kind of maintaining this. Um, so one way of maintaining this in the main model is that you would create a view template called design option in your project that as you can see here, it only includes the Revit models. It will exclude everything else. So you start with this. Um, when you click on the links, you will see that all the links that are linked in your, into your model also as well as repeated instances of that link. So let's say uh, if you set it by host view, then it will just take the design, the primary design option. If it's something that's uh, uh, needed to show a different design option, then you can address it there. Um, and as you can see here, these names are the unique uh, uh, identifier that are in the project that refers to the link name. So each, each of these links, you can assign this parameter to them and kind of address them separately. Um, in terms of consultant workflows, um, they would have to, um, for this project, we had consultants in CAD. On other projects that we worked on, we had them on Revit. Uh, so uh, it really depends on the project and what you end up um, sorting the workflows with your consultants and how they would do this. For this, uh, we had to also utilize this workflow when we're uh, looking at the model from the shell file or from the visualization file, is that we had to create a linked by view uh, view in the main model that looks at all these um, link module because in Revit you're not able to look at these uh, attached links uh, you're you're not able to have visibility to them from here um, so we had uh, the link by view uh, workflow as well um, and so we've done that and then we would assign it once again do the same workflow as we discussed earlier is that we assign the design option work uh, uh, template first and then the main model one after. Um, there are other workflows you can, you can do this. You'd have to uh, accept the design options and make them make them primary or accept them and then save as a new file for that design option. Okay, um, this is uh, going back to the to uh, type uh, door scheduling that we uh, discussed earlier. I'm just going to go back and forth between these two slides. So basically, we've utilized um, ID8 software to do this. Uh, what it allows you to do, ID8 PIMLink allows you to ex export the data live from the model and compiles, uh, and then it exports it into Excel. And then you can do whatever you want in Excel to manipulate all your data. So what we ended up doing is we compiled a list of all the type of doors that, and their corresponding parameters, and then you utilize VLOOKUP tables to fill them out. Um, there is one workflow where you can um, you utilize ID8 Sticky, which sticks it back into your project for documentation, but it's uh, it's an Excel Sticky. It wouldn't push the information back. The other way is obviously pushing the information back, which is something that we didn't end up doing in here because of the timeline of the project, is that we had maintained a list and then we sticked it back into the project. So if someone needs an, to update that list, they'd have to go back into Revit uh, do an ID8 BIM link export, um, and then manipulate it uh, to that template in Excel, and then stick it back into the project. So if we go back, you'll notice um, here the tabs below. These are all the tabs in which the projects are being kept. 
and their parameters. And these are all VLOOKUP tables that tells you uh, what model has which type and then which parameters are corresponding to it. It gets populated there. I guess uh, with our lessons learned, um, uh, as you see, there was a lot of planning and thought that went into this and testing as well. We've gone through a lot of testing to do this. Uh, industrial approaches requires a lot of uh, careful early model setup and, you know, talking about the deliverables. What do you want different? Like, for example, the shell where it's kind of different one side, one site versus another. That was kind of a design decision that was specific for that project. Um, also determine which tools you need. You, you might need tools to implement some of these workflows, especially repeated uh, repeated work across models that you may need some tools to access that. Um, and it's also helpful to create a mock-up on how that workflow will go. Even if it's just like that mirror boat that we've created to just understand what the impact is of the setup. Try to vet as much as you can early on and then see how the model goes. Um, focus on training, BIM representative on the project to carry, to be able to carry out the workflows. We have a lot of, we have a lot of projects and, you know, uh, I can't realistically go into every project and do all the work. I rely on my teammates to, to get a lot of that work done and they understand the workflow clearly. Um, so any new members that are added into the project, you know, they get onboarded. We have the mirror board that's up to date and, um, also, uh, it's okay to understand that some of these uh, workflows evolved uh, as the project is evolving and new information come in. With that being said, I'd like to pass it to Enda. Okay, uh, thanks, Nadine, that was great. Um, so the final product, um, I, I sort of uh, talked a little bit about uh, some of the development of the project from our site and our shop and, and site construction point of view, but um, I'm just gonna go through a few images now. So on the screen here, you're just seeing the finished photographs for the 321 Dover Court site, and uh, bottom left is the, uh, the 11 Macy Avenue site. They're both occupied, like a, a real success story at the moment. Uh, some more images there, just, um, uh, of those uh, finished products. Um, on screen now, this is just some renderings of uh, the latest phase, phase two of those projects that we're working on. And we're actually really excited about the, the next phase of our modular evolution uh, as an office. Uh, we're currently working on a uh, passive house modular project for the city of Hamilton. Uh, could be wrong, but we think it's one of the first in Canada. So really excited about that. And um, hopefully some of you have uh, I've seen this particular project. It's uh, a modular uh, project for the Durham region uh, based in Beaverton, and it was a recent recipient of the Canadian Architect Award. 